Part One of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. Part One. Like some great silver pink fish, the ship sang on through the eternal night there was no impression of swimming the fish shape had neither fins nor a tail it was as though it were hovering in wait for a member of some smaller species to swoop suddenly down from nowhere so that it in turn could pounce and kill but still it moved only a being who was thoroughly familiar with the type could have told that this fish was dying in shape the ship was rather like a narrow flounder long tapered and oval in cross-section but it showed none of the exterior markings one might expect of either a living thing or of a spaceship with one exception the smooth silver pink exterior was featureless that one exception was a long purplish black roughened discoloration that ran along one side for almost half of the ship's seventeen meters in length it was the only external sign that the ship was dying inside the ship the knipe neither knew nor cared about the discoloration had he thought about it he would have deduced the presence of the burn but it was the least of his worries the internal damage that had been done to the ship was by far the more serious it could quite possibly kill him the knipe of course had no intention of dying not out here not so far so very far from his own people not out here where his death would be so very improper he looked at the ball of the yellow-white sun ahead and wondered that such a relatively stable inactive star could have produced such a tremendously energetic plasmoid that it could still do the damage it had done so far out it had been a freak of course such suns as this did not normally produce such energetic swirls of magnetic force but the thing had been there none the less and the ship had hit it at high velocity fortunately the ship had only touched the edge of the swirling cloud otherwise the entire ship would have vanished in a puff of incandescence but it had done enough the power plants that drove the ship at ultralight velocities through the depths of interstellar space had been so badly damaged that they could only be used in short bursts and each burst brought them nearer to the fusion point most of the instruments were powerless the knipe was not even sure he could land the vessel any attempt to use the communicator to call home would have blown the ship to atoms the knipe did not want to die but if die he must he did not want to die foolishly it had taken a long time to drift in from the outer reaches of this sun's planetary system but using the power plants any more than absolutely necessary would have been foolhardy the knipe missed the companionship his brother had given him for so long his help would be invaluable now but there had been no choice there had not been enough supplies for two to survive the long fall inward toward the distant sun the knipe having discovered the fact first had out of his mercy and compassion killed his brother while the other was not looking then having eaten his brother with all due ceremony he had settled down to the long lonely wait beings of another race might have cursed the accident that had disabled the ship or regretted the necessity that one of them should die but the knipe did neither for to him the first notion would have been foolish and the second incomprehensible but now as the ship fell ever closer toward the yellow white sun he began to worry about his own fate 
For a while it had seemed almost certain that he would survive long enough to build a communicator, for the instruments had already told him and his brother that the system ahead was inhabited by creatures of reasoning power, if not true intelligence, and it would almost certainly be possible to get the equipment he needed for them. Now, though, it looked as if the ship would not survive a landing. He had had to steer it away from a great gas giant which had seriously endangered the power plants. He did not want to die in space, wasted, forever undevoured. At least he must die on a planet where there might be creatures with the compassion and wisdom to give his body the proper ingestion. The thought of feeding inferior creatures was repugnant, but it was better than rotting to feed monocells or ectogenes, and far superior to wasting away in space. Even thoughts such as these did not occupy his mind often or for very long. Far, far better than any of them was the desire and planning for survival. The outer limits of the gas giants had been passed at least, and the knife fell on through the asteroid belt without approaching any of the larger pieces of rock and metal. That he and his brother had originally elected to come into this system along its orbital plane had been a mixed blessing. To have come in at a different angle would have avoided all the debris, from planetary size on down, that is, thickest in a star's equatorial plane, but it would also have meant a much greater chance of missing a suitable planet unless too much reliance was placed on the already weakened power generators as it was the knight had been able to use the gravitational field of the gas giant to swing his ship toward the precise spot where the third planet would be when the ship arrived in the third orbit moreover the third planet would be retreating from the knight's line of flight which would make the velocity difference that much less. For a while, the Nipe had toyed with the idea of using the mining bases that the local life form had set up in the asteroid belt as bases for his own operations, but he had decided against it. Movement would be much freer and much more productive on a planet than it would be in the belt. He would have preferred using the fourth planet for his base. Although much smaller, it had the same reddish and look, reddish, arid look, as his own home planet, while the third world was three-quarters drowned in water. But there were two factors that weighed so heavily against that choice that they rendered it impossible. In the first place, by far the greater proportion of the local inhabitants' commerce was between the asteroids and the third planet. Second, and much more important, the fourth world was at such a point in her orbit that the energy required to land would destroy the ship beyond any doubt it would have to be the third world as the ship fell inward the knight watched his pitifully inadequate instruments doing his best to keep tabs on every one of the feebly powered ships that the local life form used to move through space he did not want to be spotted now and even though the odds were against these beings having any instrument highly developed enough to spot his craft, there was always the possibility that he might be observed optically. So he squatted there in the ship, a centipede-like thing about five feet in length and a little less than eighteen inches in diameter, with eight articulated limbs spaced in pairs along his body, any one of which could be used as hand or foot. His head, which was long and snouted, displayed two pairs of violet eyes, which kept a constant watch on the indicators and screens of the few instruments that were still functioning aboard the ship. And he waited as the ship fell towards its rendezvous with the third planet. Wang Kulichenko pulled the collar of his uniform coat up closer around his ears, and pulled the helmet and face mask down a bit. It was only early October, but here in the tundra country the wind had a tendency to be chill and biting in the morning, even at this time of year. Within a week or so he'd have to start using the power pack on his horse to electrically warm his protective clothing and the horse's wrappings, 
but there was no necessity of that yet he smiled a little as he always did when he thought of his grandfather's remarks about such new-fangled nonsense your ancestors son of my son he would say conquered the tundra and lived upon it for thousands of years without the need of such womanish things are there no men any more are there none who can face nature alone and unafraid without the aid of artifices that bring softness but wang kulichenko noticed though out of politeness he never pointed it out that the old man never failed to take advantage of the electric warmth of the house when the short days came and the snows blew across the country like fine white sand and he never complained about the lights or the television or the hot water except to grumble occasionally that they were a little old and out of date and that the mail order catalogue showed that better models were available in vladivostok and wang would remind the old man very gently that a paper forest ranger made only so much money and that there would have to be more savings before such things could be bought he did not ever remind the old man that he wang was stretching a point to keep his grandfather on the payroll as an assistant wang kulichenko patted his horse's rump and urged her softly to step up her pace just a bit he had a certain amount of territory to cover and although he wanted to be careful in his checking he also wanted to get home early around him the neatly planted forest of paper trees spread knotty alien branches trying to catch the rays of the winter waning sun whenever wang thought of his grandfather's remarks about his ancestors he always wondered as a corollary what those same ancestors would have thought about a forest growing up here where no forest like this one had ever grown before they were called paper trees because the bulk of their pulp was used to make paper they were of no use whatever as lumber but they weren't trees really and the organic chemicals that were leached from them during the pulping process were of far more value than the paper pulp they were mutations of a smaller plant that had been found in the temperate regions of mars and purposely changed genetically to grow on the siberian tundra where the conditions were similar to but superior to their natural habitat they looked as though someone had managed to crossbreed the joshua tree with the cypress and then persuaded the result to grow grass instead of leaves in the distance wang heard the whining of the wind and he automatically pulled his coat a little tighter even though he noticed no increase in the wind velocity around him then as the whine became louder he realized that it was not the wind he turned his head toward the noise and looked up for a long minute he watched the sky as the sound gained volume but he could see nothing at first then he caught a glimpse of motion a dot that was hard to distinguish against the cloud mottled gray sky what was it an air transport in trouble there were two transpolar routes that passed within a few hundred miles of here but no air transport he had ever seen had made a noise like that normally they were so high as to be both invisible and inaudible must be trouble of some sort he reached down to the saddlebag without taking his eyes off the moving speck and took out the radio phone he held it to his ear and thumbed the call button insistently grandfather he thought with growing irritation as the seconds passed wake up come on old dozer rouse yourself from your dreams at the same time he checked his wrist compass and estimated the direction of flight of the dot and its direction from him he'd at least be able to give the airline authorities some information if the ship fell he wished there were some way to triangulate its height and so on but he had no need for that kind of thing so he hadn't the equipment yes yes came a testy dry voice through the earphone quickly wang gave his grandfather all the information he had on the flying thing by now the whine had become a shrill roar and the thing in the air had become a silver pink fish shape i think it's coming down very close to here wang concluded 
You call the authorities and let them know that one of the aircraft is in trouble. I'll see if I can be of any help here. I'll call you back later. As you say, the old man said hurriedly. He cut off. Wang was beginning to realize that the thing was a spaceship, not an airship. By this time, he could see the thing more clearly. He had never actually seen a spacecraft, but he'd seen enough of them on television to know what they looked like. This one didn't look like a standard type at all, and it didn't behave like one, but it looked even less like an airship, and he knew enough to know that he didn't necessarily know every type of spaceship ever built. In shape, it resembled the old rocket-propelled jobs that had been first used for space exploration a century before, rather than looking like the fat ovoids that he was used to. But there were no signs of rocket exhausts, and yet the ship was very obviously slowing, so it must have an inertia drive. It was coming in much lower now, on a line north of him, headed almost due east. He urged the mare forward, in order to try to keep up with the craft, although it was obviously going several hundred miles per hour, hardly a horse's pace. Still, it was slowing rapidly, very rapidly. Maybe he kept the mare moving. The strange ship skimmed along the treetops in the distance and disappeared from sight. Then there was a thunderous crash, a tearing of wood and foliage, and a grinding, plowing sound. For a few seconds afterward, there was silence. Then there came a soft rumble, as of water beginning to boil in some huge but distant samovar. It seemed to go on and on and on, and there was a bluish, fluctuating glow on the horizon. Radioactivity? Wang wondered. Surely not an atomic-powered ship without safety cutoffs in this day and age. He pulled out his radio phone and thumbed the call button again. This time there was no delay. Yes? How are the radiation detectors behaving there, Grandfather? One moment I shall see. Then there was a silence. Then, no unusual activity, young Wang. Why? Wang told him, then asked, Did you get hold of the air authorities? Yes. They have no missing aircraft, but they're checking with the space fields. The way you describe it, the thing must be a spaceship of some kind. I think so, too. I wish I had a radiation detector here, though. I'd like to see whether that thing is hot or not. It's only a couple of miles or so away. I think I'd better stay away. Meanwhile, you'd better put in a call to Central Headquarters Fire Control. There's going to be a holocaust if I'm any judge, unless they get here fast with plenty of equipment. I'll see to it, said his grandfather, cutting off. The bluish glow in the sky had quite died away by now, and the distant rumbling was gone, too. And, oddly enough, there was not much smoke in the distance. There was a small cloud of gray that rose, streamer-like, from where the glow had been, but even that faded away fairly rapidly in the chill breeze. Quite obviously, there would be no fire. After several more minutes of watching, he was sure of it. There couldn't have been much heat produced in that explosion, if it could really be called an explosion. Then he saw something moving in the trees between himself and the spot where the ship had come down. He couldn't quite see what it was, but it looked like someone crawling. "'Hello there,' he called out. "'Are you hurt?' There was no answer. Perhaps whoever it was didn't understand Russian. Wang's command of English wasn't too good, but he called out in that language. Still... There was no answer. Whoever it was had crawled out of sight. Then he realized that it couldn't be anyone crawling. No one could have run the distance between here and the ship in the time since it had hit, much less crawled. He frowned. A wolf, then? Possibly. They weren't too common, but there were still plenty of them around. He unholstered the heavy pistol at his side and, as he slid the barrel free, 
he became the first human being ever to see the knife for an instant as the knife came out from behind a tree fifteen feet away wang kulichenko froze as he saw those four baleful violet eyes glaring at him from the snouted head he jerked up the pistol to fire he was much too late his reflexes were too slow by far the knife launched itself across the intervening space in a blur of speed that would have made a leopard seem slow the alien's hands slapped aside the gun with a violence that broke the man's wrist while other hands slammed at his skull wang kulichingo hardly had time to be surprised before he died the knife stood quietly for a moment looking down at the thing he had killed his stomach churned with disgust he ignored the fading hoofbeats of the slave animal from which he had knocked the thing that lay on the ground with a crushed skull the slave animal was unintelligent and unimportant this was the intelligent one but so slow so incredibly slow and so weak and soft it seemed impossible that such poorly equipped beasts could have survived long enough on any world to evolve to become the dominant life form perhaps it was not the dominant form perhaps it was merely a higher slave animal he would have to do more investigating he picked up the weapon the thing had drawn and examined it carefully the mechanism was unfamiliar but a glance at the muzzle told him that it was a projectile weapon of some sort the twisted grooves in the barrel were obviously designed to impart a spin to the projectile to give it gyroscopic stability while in flight the dead thing must have thought he was a wild animal the knife decided surely no being would carry a weapon for use against members of its own or another intelligent species he examined the rest of the equipment on the thing not much information there too bad the slave animal was gone there had apparently been more equipment strapped to it the next question was what should he do with the body devour it properly as one should with a validly slain foe it didn't seem that he could do anything else and yet his stomachs wanted to rebel at the thought after all it wasn't as if the thing were really a proper being it was astonishing to find another intelligent race none had ever been found before but he was determined to show them that he was civilized and intelligent too on the other hand they were obviously of a lower order than the knipe and that made the question even more puzzling in the end he decided to leave the thing here for the others of its kind to find they would doubtless consume it properly and he glanced at the sky and listened they would be here in time there were aircraft coming he would have to leave quickly he had to find one of their production or supply centers and he would have to do it alone with only the equipment he had on him the utter destruction of his ship had left him seriously hampered he began moving staying in the protection of the trees his ethical sense still bothering him it was not at all civilized to leave a body to the mercy of lesser animals or monocells like that what kind of monster would they think he was still there was no help for it if they caught him while feeding they might have thought him a lower animal and shot him he couldn't put an onus like that upon them he moved on end of part one Part Two of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. Two fifths of a second. That was all the time Bart Stanton had from the first moment his supersensitive ears heard the faint whisper of metal against leather. He made good use of it. The noise had come from behind and slightly to the left of him, 
so he drew his own gun with his left hand and spun to his left as he dropped to a crouch he had turned almost completely around drawn his gun and fired three shots before the other man had even leveled his own weapon the bullets from stanton's gun made three round spots on the man's jacket almost touching each other and directly over the heart the man blinked stupidly for a moment looking down at the round spots my god he said softly then the man returned his weapon slowly to his holster the big room was noisy the three shots had merely added to the noise of the gunfire that rattled intermittently around the two men and even that gunfire was only a part of the cacophony the tortured molecules of the air in the room were so besieged by the beat of drums the blare of trumpets the crackle of lightning the rumble of heavy machinery the squawks and shrieks of horns and whistles the rustle of autumn leaves the machine-gun snap of popping popcorn the clink and jingle of falling coins and the yelps bellows howls roars snarls grunts bleats moos purrs cackles quacks chirps buzzes and hisses of a myriad of animals that each molecule would have thought that it was being shoved in a hundred thousand different directions at once if it had had a mind to think with the noise wasn't deafening but it was all pervasive bart stanton had reholstered his own weapon and half opened his lips to speak when he heard another sound behind him again he whirled his guns in hand both of them this time and his four fingers only fractions of a millimeter from the point that would fire the hair triggers but he did not fire the second man had merely shifted the weapons in his holsters and then dropped his hands away the noise which had been flooding into the room over the speaker system died instantly stanton shoved his guns back into place and rose from his crouch real cute he said grinning i wasn't expecting that one the man he was facing smiled back well bart maybe we've proved our point what do you think colonel the last was addressed to the third man who was still standing quietly looking worried and surprised about the three spots on his jacket that had come from the special harmless projectiles in stanton's gun colonel mannheim was four inches shorter than stanton's five ten and was fifteen years older but in spite of the differences he would have laughed at any one who had told him five minutes before that he couldn't outdraw a man who was standing with his back turned his bright blue eyes set deep beneath craggy brows and a tanned face looked speculatively at the younger man incredible he said gently absolutely incredible then he looked at the other man a lean civilian with mild blue eyes a shade lighter than his own all right dr farnsworth i'm convinced you and your staff have quite literally created a superman anyone who can stand in a noise-filled room and hear a man draw a gun twenty feet behind him is incredible enough the fact that he could and did outdraw and outshoot me after i had started well that's almost beyond comprehension he looked back at bart stanton what's your opinion mr stanton think you can handle the knife stanton paused imperceptibly before answering while his ultra-fast mind considered the problem and arrived at a decision just how much confidence should he show the colonel mannheim was a man with tremendous confidence in himself but who was capable of recognizing that there were men who were his superiors in one field or another if i can't dispose of the knife stanton said no one can colonel mannheim nodded slowly i believe you're right he said at last his voice was firm with inner conviction he shot a glance at farnsworth how about the second man farnsworth shook his head he'll never make it in another two years we can put him into reasonable shape again but his nervous system just couldn't stand the gaff 
Can we get another man ready in time? Hardly. We can't just pick a man up off the street and turn him into a superman. Even if we could find another subject with Bart's genetic possibilities, it would take more time than we have to spare. This isn't magic, Colonel. You don't change a nobody into a physical and mental giant by saying abracadabra or by teaching him how to pronounce Shazam properly. I'm aware of that, said Colonel Mannheim without rancor. Five years of work on Mr. Stanton must have taught you something, though. I should think you could repeat the process in less time. Farnsworth repeated the head-shaking. Human beings aren't machines, Colonel. They require time to heal, time to learn, time to integrate themselves. Remember that in spite of all our increased knowledge of anesthesia, antibiotics, viricides, and obstetrics, it still takes nine months to produce a baby. We're in the same position, only more so. I see, said Mannheim. Besides, Dr. Farnsworth continued, Stanton's body and nervous system are now close to the theoretical limit for human tissue. I'm afraid you don't realize what kind of mental stability and organization are required to handle the equipment he now has. I'm sure I don't, the colonel agreed. I doubt if anyone besides Stanton himself knows. Dr. Farnsworth's manner softened a little. You're probably quite right. Suffice it to say that Bartholomew Stanton is the only answer we've found so far, and the only answer visible in the foreseeable future to the problem posed by the Nipe. The colonel's face darkened. I keep hoping that our policy of handling the Nipe hasn't been a mistake. If it has, it's going to prove a fatal one for the whole race. Let's go into the lounge, Farnsworth said. Standing around in an empty chamber like this isn't the most comfortable way to discuss the fate of mankind. His voice brought hollow echoes from the walls. Colonel Mannheim grinned at the touch of lightness the biophysicist had injected into the conversation. Very well, I could do with some coffee, if you have some. All you want, said Dr. Farnsworth, leading the way toward the door of the chamber and opening it. Or if you'd prefer something with a little more power to it? Thanks, no, coffee will do fine, said Mannheim. How about you, Mr. Stanton? Bart Stanton shook his head. I'd love to have some coffee, but I'll leave the alcohol alone. I'd just have the luck to be finishing a drink when our friend the Nipe popped in on us. And when I do meet him, I'm going to need every microsecond of reflex speed I can scrape up. They walked down a soft-floored, warmly lit corridor to an elevator which whisked them up to the main level of the Neurophysical Institute building. Another corridor led them to a room that might have been the common room of one of the more exclusive men's clubs. There were soft chairs and shelves of books and reading tables and smoking stands, all quietly luxurious. There was no one in the room when the three men entered. "'We can have some privacy here,' Dr. Farnsworth said. "'None of the rest of the staff will come in until we're through.' Colonel Mannheim looked at the biophysicist speculatively. You seem to think secrecy is important all of a sudden. Bart Stanton grinned and kept silent. Dr. Farnsworth went over to a table where an urn of coffee radiated soft warmth. Cream and sugar over there on the tray, he said as he began to fill cups. Frankly, Colonel Mannheim said, I was going to ask you to find us a place where we could talk privately. You seem to have anticipated me. I thought you might have something like that in mind, said Dr. Farnsworth without looking up. The cups were filled, and the three men sat down in a triangle of chairs before any of them spoke again. Colonel Mannheim took a sip from his cup and then looked up. All right, we'll begin this way. Mr. Stanton... Granted that you've been through five years of hell, but how closely have you stayed in touch with the Nipe situation? As best I could, through news bulletins and information that your office has sent here. Could you give me an oral summary? Bart Stanton thought for a moment, 
It was true that he'd been out of touch with what had been going on outside the walls of the Neurophysical Institute for the past five years. In spite of the reading he'd done and the newscasts he'd watched and the TV tapes he'd seen, he still had no real feeling for the situation. There were hazy periods during that five years. He had undergone extensive glandular and neural operations of great delicacy, many of which had resulted in what could have been agonizing pain without the use of suppressors. As a result, he possessed a biological engine that, for sheer driving power and nicety of control, surpassed any other known to exist or to have ever existed on Earth, with the possible exception of the Nipe. But those five years of rebuilding and retraining had left a gap in his life. Several of the steps required to make the conversion from man to superman had resulted in temporary insanity, the wild swinging imbalances of glandular secretions seeking a new balance, the erratic misfirings of neurons as they attempted to adjust to higher nerve impulse velocities, and the sheer fatigue engendered by cells which were acting too rapidly for a lagging excretory system, all had contributed to periods of greater or lesser mental abnormality. That he was sane now, there was no question. But there were holes in his memory that still had to be filled. He began to talk, rapidly but carefully, telling the colonel all he knew about the situation up to the present. It wasn't much. It was late October, 2091, and the Nipe, blithely evading capture for ten long years, was still going about his unknown and possibly incomprehensible business. The Nipe had become a legend. He had replaced Satan, the Boogeyman, Frankenstein's monster, and Mumbo Jumbo, Lord of the Congo, in the public mind. He had taken on, in popular thought, the attributes of the genie, the vampire, the ghoul, the werewolf, and every other horror and hobgoblin that the mind of man had conjured up in the previous half-million years. That he had been connected with the mysterious crash in Siberia ten years before was almost a certainty. How he had managed to get from there to Leningrad without being seen once was more of a mystery but certainly not impossible in the light of what had been done since. Eight months later, a non-vision phone call had been received by the Regents' Board of the Khrushchev Memorial Psychiatric Hospital in Leningrad. An odd, breathy voice offered, in very bad Russian, a meeting. The Nipe had managed to explain, in spite of the language handicap, that he did not want to be mistaken for a wild animal, as had happened with the forest ranger. The psychiatrists were divided in their opinions. Some thought that the call had been from a deranged person. When the knife actually showed up at the appointed place, those minds changed rapidly. The knife's ability to use any human language was limited. He picked up vocabulary and grammatical rules very rapidly, but he seemed completely unable to use a language beyond discussion of concrete actions and objects. His mind was simply too alien to enable him to do more than touch the edges of human communication. In the discussion of mathematics in particular, the Nipe seemed to be completely at a loss. He apparently thought of mathematics as a spoken language instead of a written one, and could not progress beyond simple diagrams. He wasn't captured in any real sense of the word. He refused to allow any physical tests on his body, and, short of threatening him at gunpoint, there didn't seem to be any practicable way to force him to accede to the human's wishes, and they couldn't do that. The Nipe had to be treated as an emissary from his home world, wherever that was. He killed a man, yes, but... That had to be allowed as justifiable homicide in self-defense, since the forester had drawn a gun and was ready to fire. Nobody could blame the late Wang Kulachenko for that, but nobody could blame the Nipe either. For six weeks, the humans and the Nipe 
had tried to arrive at a meeting of minds and just when it would seem within grasp it would fade away into mist it was nearly a month before the russian psychologists and psychiatrists realized that the reason the knife had come to them was because he had thought that they were the ruling body of that territory the u.n observers had stayed out of it at first before there was any kind of talk on a government level there must be some kind of understanding on a personal level and that of course was never achieved just what had set off the knife's anger hasn't been established yet as far as stanton knew at a meeting one day he had simply become more and more incomprehensible and then without any warning he had leaped out killed three of the men with his bare hands and gone out the window and that had been the end of any diplomatic relations between humanity and the knife since that time he'd been on a rampage of robbery and murder he was as callously indifferent to human life and property as a human being might be with the life and property of a cockroach there have been human criminals whose actions could be described in the same way but the knife had a few touches that few human criminals would have thought of and almost none would have had the capacity to execute if for instance the knife had time to spare his victims would be annoying problems in identification when found for there would be nothing left but well-gnawed bones and time to spare in this case meant twenty or thirty minutes the knife had if nothing else a very efficient digestive tract he ate like a shrew and the knife never under any circumstances used any weapon but the weapons nature had given him hands or feet or claws or teeth never did he use a knife or gun or even a club almost as an afterthought one realized that the loot which the knife stole was seemingly unpredictable money as such he apparently had no use for he had taken gold silver and platinum but one raid for each of these elements had evidently been enough except for silver which had required three raids over a period of four years since then he hadn't touched silver again he hadn't tried yet for any of the radioactives except radium he'd taken a full ounce of that in five raids but hadn't attempted to get his hands on uranium thorium plutonium or any of the other elements normally associated with atomic energy nor had he tried to steal any of the fusion materials the heavy isotopes of hydrogen or any of the lithium isotopes beryllium had been taken but whether there was any significance in the thefts or not no one knew there was a pattern in the thefts nonetheless they had begun small and increased scientific and technical instruments oscilloscopes x-ray generators radar equipment maser sets dynostatic crystals thermolite resonators and so on were stolen complete or gutted for various parts after a while he went on to bigger things whole aircraft with their crews had vanished that he had not committed anywhere near all the crimes that had been attributed to him was certain that he had committed a great many of them was equally certain there was no doubt at all that his loot was being used to make instruments and devices of unknown kinds he had used several of them on his raids the one that could apparently phase out almost any electromagnetic frequency up to about a hundred thousand megacycles including sixty cycle power frequencies was considered to be a particularly cute item so was the gadget that reduced the tensile strength of concrete to about that of a good grade of marshmallow after he had been operating for a few years there was no installation on the face of the earth that could be considered night proof for more than a few minutes he struck when and where he wanted and took whatever he needed it was manifestly impossible to guard against the knife since no one knew what sort of loot might strike his fancy next 
and there was therefore no way of knowing where or how he would hit next nor could he ever be found after one of his raids they were plotted and followed out with diabolical accuracy and thoroughness he struck looted and vanished and wasn't seen again until his next strike colonel mannheim who had carefully puffed a cigar alight and smoked it thoroughly during stanton's recitation dropped the remains of the cigar into an ash receptacle accurate but incomplete he said quietly you must have made some guesses he looked from bart stanton to dr farnsworth i'd like to hear them farnsworth finished off the last of his coffee we've talked about it he admitted although i must say the hypothesis bart has come up with would never have occurred to me i'm still not sure i credit it but he shrugged i can't say that i disbelieve it either Mannheim turned his eyes back to stanton his silence was a question logically my theory mightn't hold much water stanton admitted but the evidence seems to be conclusive enough to me he got up went over to the coffee urn and refilled his cup it seems incredible to me that the combined intelligence and organizational ability of the u.n government is incapable of finding anything out about one single alien no matter how competent he may be he said as he returned to his seat somehow somewhere someone must have gotten a line on the knipe he must have a base for his operations and someone should have found it by this time if there is such a base then it must be possible to blast him out of it without resorting to the kind of work it took to produce me i may be faster and more sensitive and stronger than the average man but that doesn't mean that i have superhuman abilities to the extent that i can do in two or three years what the combined forces of the government couldn't do in ten certainly you wouldn't rely too heavily on it and yet apparently you are to me that can only mean that you've got another ace up your sleeve you know we're going to get the knife before i die you either have a sure way of tracing him or else you already know where he is which is it colonel mannheim sighed we know where he is we've known for six years end of part two Part three of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three. Interlude. The woman's eyes were filled with tears, for which the doctor was privately thankful. At least the original shock had worn off. And uh, there's nothing we can do? Uh, nothing? There was a slight catch in her voice i'm afraid not not yet there are research teams working on the problem and one day perhaps then he shook his head but not yet he paused i'm sorry mr stanton the woman sat there on the comfortable chair and looked at the specialist diploma that hung on the doctor's wall and yet she didn't really see the diploma at all she was seeing something else a kind of dream that had been shattered after a moment she began to speak her voice low and gentle as though the dream were still going on and she were half afraid she might waken herself if she spoke too loudly jim and i were so glad they were twins identical twin boys he said i remember he said we ought to call em ike and mike and he laughed a little when he said it to show he didn't mean it i remember i was propped up in the bed the afternoon they were born and jim had brought me a new bed jacket and i said i didn't need a new one because i would be going home the next day and he said hell kid you didn't think i'd just buy a bed jacket just for hospital use do you this is for breakfasts in bed too and that's when he said he'd seen the boys and said we ought to name them ike and mike the tears were coming down mr stanton's cheeks heavily now 
and grief made her look older than her twenty-four years. But the doctor said nothing, letting her spill out her emotions in words. We'd talked about it before, you know, as soon as the obstetrician found out that I was going to have twins, and Jim... Uh, Jim said that we shouldn't name them alike, unless they were identical twins or mirror twins. If they were fraternal twins, we'd just name them as if they'd been ordinary brothers or sisters or whatever, you know? She looked at the doctor, pleading for understanding. I know, he said. And Jim was always kidding. If they were girls, he said we ought to call them Flora and Dora, or Annie and Fanny, or maybe Susie and Floozy. He was always kidding about it, you know? I know, said the doctor. And then, when they were identical boys, he was very sensible about it. We'll call them Martin and Bartholomew, he said. Then, if they want to call themselves Mart and Bart, they can, but they won't be stuck with rhyming names if they don't want them. Jim was very thoughtful that way, doctor, very thoughtful. She suddenly seemed to realize that she was crying, and took a handkerchief out of her sleeve to dab at her eyes and face. I'll have to quit crying, she said, trying to sound brave and strong. After all, it could have been worse, couldn't it? I mean, the radiation could have killed my boys, too. Jim's dead, yes, and I've got to get used to that. But I still have two boys to take care of, and they'll need me. Yes, Mr. Stanton, they will, said the doctor. They'll both need you, and you'll have to be very gentle and very careful with both of them. How... How do you mean that? she asked. The doctor settled back in his chair and chose his words carefully. Identical twins tend to identify with each other, Mr. Stanton. There is a great deal of empathy between people who are not only of the same age, but genetically identical. If they were both healthy, there would be very little trouble in their education at home or at school. Any of the standard tests on psychodynamics and education will show you the pitfalls to avoid when dealing with identical siblings. But these boys are no longer identical. One is normal, healthy, and lively. The other is, well, as you have seen, he is slow, sluggish, and badly coordinated. That condition may improve with time, but until we know more about such damage than we do now, he will be an invalid. That's the trouble with radiation damage, Mr. Stanton. Even when we can save the victim's life, we cannot always save his health. You can see, I think, what sort of psychic disturbances this can bring about in such a pair. The ill boy tends to identify with the well one, and unfortunately the reverse is true. If they are not properly handled during their formative years, Mr. Stanton, both can be badly damaged emotionally. I... I think I understand, the woman said. But what sort of thing should I look out for? I suggest that you get a good man in psychic development, the doctor said. I'd hesitate to prescribe. It's out of my field. But in general, most of your trouble will be caused by a tendency for the pair to swing into one of two extremes. Mutual antagonism can arise if one becomes jealous of the other's health, while the healthy one becomes jealous of the extra consideration shown his crippled brother. Or, on the other hand, the healthy boy may identify so closely with his brother that he feels every hurt or slight, real or imagined. He becomes overly solicitous, overprotective. At the same time, the other brother may come to depend completely on the healthy twin. In both these situations, there is a positive feedback which constantly worsens the situation. It requires a great deal of careful observation and careful application of the proper educational stimuli to keep the situation from developing toward either extreme. You'll need expert help if you want both boys to display the full abilities of which they are potentially capable. I see. Could you give me the name of a good man, doctor? The doctor nodded and picked up a book on his desk. I'll give you several names. You can pick the one you like. They're all good men. There are many good women in the field, too, but in this case, I think a man would be best. Of course, if one of them thinks a woman is indicated, that's up to him. 
As I said, this isn't my field. He opened the small book and rifled through it to find the names he wanted. The image of the knipe on the glowing screen was clear and finely detailed. It was, Bart thought, as though one were looking through a window into the knipe's nest itself. Only the tremendous depth of focus of the lens which caught the picture gave the illusion a sense of unreality. Everything, background and foreground alike, was sharply in focus. The knipe moved in slow motion, giving the watchers the eerie feeling that he was moving through a thicker, heavier medium than air, in a place where the gravity was much less than that of Earth. "'Speed the tape up to normal,' said Colonel Mannheim to the man who was operating the machine. "'If there is anything Mr. Stanton wants to look at more closely, we can run through it again.' As if in obedience to the Colonel's command, the knipe seemed to shake himself a little and go about his business more briskly, and the air and gravity seemed to revert to those of Earth. "'What's he doing?' Stanton asked. The knipe was doing something with an odd-looking box that sat on the floor in front of him. He's got a screwdriver that he's modified to give it a head with an L-shaped cross-section, and he's wiggling it around inside that hole in the box. But what he's doing is a secret between God and the knipe at this point, the colonel said glumly. Stanton glanced away from the screen for a moment to look at the other men who were there. Some of them were watching the screen, but most of them seemed to be watching Stanton, although they looked away as soon as they saw his eyes on them. Trying to see what kind of a bloke this touted Superman is, Stanton thought. Well, I can't say I blame him. He brought his attention back to the screen. So this was the knife side away. He wondered if it were furnished in the fashion that a knife's living quarters would be furnished on whatever planet the multi-legged horror called home. Probably it had the same similarity as Robinson Crusoe's island home had to a middle-class 19th century English home. There was no furniture at all as such. Low slung as he was, the knife needed no tables for his work and sleeping was a form of metabolic rest that he evidently found unnecessary, although he would sometimes just remain quiet for periods of time, ranging from a few minutes to a couple of hours. "'We had a hard time getting the first cameras in there,' the colonel was saying. "'That's why we missed some of the early stages of his work. There, look at that. "'That attachment he's making? That's right. Now—' It looks as though it's a meter of some kind, but we don't know whether it's a test instrument or an integral part of the machine he's making. The whole thing might be a test instrument. After all, he had to start out from the very beginning, making the tools to make the tools to make the tools, you know. It's not quite as bad as all that, said one of the other men, who had been briefly introduced to Stanton as Fred Mayer. After all... He had our technology to draw upon. If he'd been wrecked on Earth two or three centuries ago, he wouldn't have been able to do a thing. Granted, the colonel said agreeably, but it's quite obvious that there are parts of our technology that are just as alien to him as parts of his are to us. Remember how he went to all the trouble of building a pentode vacuum tube for a job that could have been done by transistors? His knowledge of solid-state physics seems to be about a century and a half behind ours. Not completely, Colonel, Mayor said. That gimmick he built last year, the one that blinded those people in Baghdad, had five perfect emeralds in it connected in series with silver wire. That's true. Our technologies seem to overlap in some areas, but in others there's total alienness. Which one would you say was the head of the other? Stanton asked. Hard to say, said Colonel Mannheim, but I'd put my money on his technology as encompassing more than ours, at least in so far as the physical sciences are concerned. I agree, said Mayer. He's got things in that little nest of his that— He stopped and shook his head slowly, as though he couldn't find words. I'll say this, 
Bart Stanton said musingly. Our friend, the Nipe, has plenty of guts and patience. He smiled a little and then amended his statement. From our point of view, that is. Colonel Mannheim's face took on a quizzical expression. How do you mean? I was about to agree with you until you tacked that last phrase on. What does point of view have to do with it? Everything, I should say, Stanton said. It all depends on the equipment an individual has. A man who rushes into a burning building to save a life wearing nothing but street clothes has courage. A man who does the same thing when he's wearing a nulotherm suit is an unknown quantity. There is no way of knowing from that action alone whether he has courage or not. Mayer looked a little dazed. Pardon me if I seem thick, Mr. Stanton, but are you saying that the Knipe's technological equipment is better than ours? Not at all. I'm talking about his personal equipment. He turned again to the colonel. Colonel Mannheim, do you think it would require any personal courage on my part to stand up against you in a face-to-face -face gunfight? The colonel grinned tightly. I see what you mean. No, it wouldn't. On the other hand, if you were to challenge me, Bart Stanton continued, would that show courage? Not really. Foolhardiness, stupidity, or insanity, not courage. Then neither of us can prove we have guts enough to fight the other, can we? Colonel Mannheim smiled grimly and said nothing. But Mayer, who evidently had a great deal of respect for the colonel, said, Now, wait a second. That depends on the circumstances. If Colonel Mannheim, say, knew that forcing you to shoot him would save someone else's life, someone more important, say, or maybe a lot of people, then... Colonel Mannheim laughed. <laughs> Mayor, you've just proved Mr. Stanton's point. Mayor gaped for a half second then burst into laughter himself pardon my point of view mr stanton i guess i am a little slow mannheim said precisely whether the knife has courage or patience or any other human feeling depends on his own abilities and on how much information he has a man can perform any action without fear if he knows that it will not hurt him or if he does not know that it will. He glanced at the screen. The knife had settled down into his sleeping position, unmoving, although his baleful violet eyes were still open. Cut that off, Mayor, the colonel said. There's not much to learn from the rest of that tape. Have you actually managed to build any of the devices he's constructed? Stanton asked. Some, said Colonel Mannheim, we have specialists all over the world studying the tapes. We have the advantage of being able to watch every step the knife makes, and we know the materials he's using to work with. But even so, the scientists are baffled by many of them. Can you imagine the time James Clerk Maxwell would have had trying to build a modern television set from tapes like this? I know exactly how he'd feel, Mayer said glumly. You can see, then, why we're depending on you, Mannheim told Stanton. Stanton merely nodded. The knowledge that he was actually a focal point in human history, that the whole future of the human race depended to a tremendous extent on him, was a realization that weighed heavily, and at the same time was immensely bracing. And now, the colonel said, I'll turn you over to the psychology department. They'll be able to give you a great deal more information on the Nipe than I can. The Nipe squatted, brooding in his underground nest, waiting for the special crystallization process to take place in the sodium-gold alloy that was forming in the reactor. How long? he wondered. He was not thinking of the crystallization reaction. He knew the timing of that to the fraction of a second. His dark thoughts were focused inwardly upon himself. How long would it be before he would be able to construct the communicator that would put him in touch with his own race again?' 
how long before he could discourse again with reasonable beings for how much longer would he be stranded on an insane planet surrounded by degraded insane beings the work was going incredibly slowly he had known at the beginning that his knowledge of the basic arts required to build a communicator was incomplete but he had not realized just how painfully inadequate it was time after time his instruments had simply refused to function because of some basic flaw in their manufacture some flaw that an expert in the field could have pointed out at once time after time equipment had had to be rebuilt almost from the beginning and time after time only cut and try methods were available for correcting his errors not even his prodigious and accurate memory could hold all the information that was necessary for the work and there were no reference tapes available of course he had long since given up any attempt to understand the functioning of the mad pseudo civilization that surrounded him he was quite certain that the beings he had seen could not possibly be the real rulers of this society but he had as yet no inkling as to who the real rulers were as to where they were that question seemed a little easier to answer it was highly probable that they were out in space on the asteroids that his instruments had detected as he had dropped in toward this planet so many years before he had made an error back then in not landing in the belt but at no time since had he experienced the emotion of regret or wished he had done differently both thoughts would have been incomprehensible to the knipe he had made an error the circumstances had been checked and noted he would not make that error again what further action could be taken by a logical mind none the past was unchangeable it existed only as a memory in his own mind and there was no way to change that indelible record even had he wished to do such an insane thing surely he thought the real rulers must know of his existence he had tried by his every action to show that he was a reasoning intelligent and civilized being why had they taken no action his hypotheses he realized were weak because of lack of data he could only wait for more information that and continue to work interlude mrs forbisher touched the control button that depolarized the window in the breakfast room letting the morning sun stream in then she said in a low voice larry come here larry forbisher looked up from his morning coffee what is it hun the stanton boys come look forbisher sighed who are the stanton boys and why should i come look but he got up and came over to the window see over there in the walkway toward the play area she said i see three girls and a boy pushing a wheel contraption forbisher said or do you mean that the stanford boys are dressed up as girls stanton she corrected him they just moved into the apartment on the first floor who the three girls no silly the two stanton boys and their mother one of them is in that wheeled contraption it's called a therapeutic chair oh so the poor kid's been hurt what's so interesting about that aside from morbid curiosity the boy pushing the chair went around a bend in the walkway out of sight and forbisher went back to his coffee while his wife spoke their names are mart and bart they're twins i should think forbisher said applying himself to his breakfast that the mother would get a self-powered chair for the boy instead of making the other boy push it the poor boy can't control the chair dear something wrong with his nervous system i understand that he was exposed to some kind of radiation when he was only two years old that's why the chair has all the instruments built into it even his heartbeat has to be controlled electronically shame 
Farbish has speared a piece of sausage. Kinda rough on both of them, I guess. How do you mean? Well, I mean, like, well, for instance, why are they going over to the play area? Play games, right? The one that's well has to push his brother over there. Can't just get out and go. Has to take the brother along. Kind of a burden, see? And then the kid in the chair has to sit there and watch his brother play basketball or jilai while he can't do anything himself. Like I say, kind of rough on both of them. Yes, I suppose it must be. More coffee? Thanks, hon. And another slice of toast, huh? End of part three. Part four of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four. The two objects floating in space both looked like pitted pieces of rock. The larger one, roughly pear-shaped and about a quarter of a mile in its greatest dimension, was actually that, a hunk of rock. The smaller, much smaller of the two, was a camouflaged spaceboat. The smaller was on a near-collision course with reference to the larger, although their relative velocities were not great. At precisely the right time, the smaller drifted by the larger only a few hundred yards away. The weakness of the gravitational fields generated between the two caused only a slight change of orbit on the part of both bodies. Then they began to separate. But during the few seconds of their closest approach, a third body had detached itself from the camouflaged spaceboat and shot rapidly across the intervening distance to land on the surface of the floating mountain. The third body was a man in a spacesuit. As soon as he landed, he sat down, stock still, and checked the instrument case he held in his hands. No response. Thus far, then, he had succeeded. He had had to pick his time precisely. The people who were already on this small planetoid could not use their detection equipment while the planetoid itself was within detection range of Beacon 971, only 280 miles away. Not if they wanted to keep from being found. Radar pulses emanating from a presumably lifeless planetoid would be a dead giveaway. Other than that, they were mathematically safe if they depended on the laws of chance. No ship moving through the asteroid belt would dare to move at any decent velocity without using radar, so the people on this particular lump of planetary flotsam would be able to spot a ship's approach easily, long before their own weak detection system could register on the pickups of the approaching ship. The power and range needed by a given detector depends on the relative velocity. The greater that velocity, the more power, the greater range needed. At one mile per second, a ship needs a range of only 30 miles to spot an obstacle 30 seconds away. At 10 miles per second, it needs a range of 300 miles. The man who called himself Stanley Martin had carefully plotted the orbit of this particular planetoid and then let his spaceboat coast in without using any detection equipment except the visual. It had been necessary, but very risky. But very risky. Had the people here seen his boat? Boat? If so, had they recognized it in spite of the heavy camouflage? And even if they only suspected, what would be their reaction? He waited. It takes nerve and patience to wait for thirteen solid hours without moving more than an occasional flexure of muscles, but he managed that long before the instrument case waggled a meter needle at him. The one relieving factor was the low gravity. On an asteroid, the problem of sleeping on a bed of nails is caused by the likelihood of accidentally throwing oneself off the bed. The probability of puncture or discomfort from the points is almost negligible. 
when the needle of the instrument panel flickered. He got to his feet and began moving. He was almost certain that he had not been detected. Walking was out of the question. This was a silicate alumina rock, not a nickel-iron one. The group that occupied it had deliberately chosen it that way, so that there would be no chance of its being picked out for slicing by one of the mining teams in the asteroid belt. Granted, the chance of any given metallic planetoids being selected was very small. They had not even wanted to take that chance. Therefore, without any magnetic field to hold him down, and only a very tiny gravitic field, the man had to use different tactics. It was more like mountain climbing than anything else, except that there was no danger of falling. He crawled over the surface in the same way that an alpine climber might climb up the side of a steep slope, seeking handholds and toeholds and using them to propel himself onward. The only difference was that he covered distance a great deal more rapidly than a mountain climber could. When he reached the spot he wanted, he carefully concealed himself beneath a craggy overhang. It took a little searching to find exactly the right spot, but when he did, he settled himself into place in a small pit and began more elaborate preparations. Self-hypnosis required nearly ten minutes. The first five or six minutes were taken up in relaxing from his exertion. Gravity notwithstanding, he had had to push his hundred and eighty pounds of mass over a considerable distance. When he was completely relaxed and completely hypnotized, he reached up and cut down the valve that fed oxygen into his suit. Then, of his own will, he went cataleptic. A single note, sounded by the instruments in the case by his side, woke him instantly. He came fully awake, as he had commanded himself to do. Immediately he turned up his oxygen intake, at the same time glancing at the clock dial in his helmet. He smiled. Nineteen days and seven hours. He had calculated it almost precisely. He wasn't more than an hour off, which was pretty good, all things considered. He consulted his instruments again. The supply ship was ten minutes away. The smile stayed on his face as he prepared for further action. The first two minutes were conscientiously spent in inhaling oxygen. Even under the best cataleptic conditions, the body tended to slow down too much. He had to get himself prepared for violent movement. Eight minutes left. He climbed out of the little grotto where he had concealed himself and moved toward the spot where he knew the airlock to the caverns underneath the planetoid's surface was hidden. Then, again, he concealed himself and waited, while he continued to breathe deeply of the highly oxygenated air in his suit. Five minutes before the ship landed, he swallowed eight ounces of the nutrient solution from the tank in the back of his helmet. The solution of amino acids, vitamins, and honey sugar also contained a small amount of stimulant of the dexedrine type and 1% ethanol. Then he unholstered his gun. It wasn't a big ship. He had known it wouldn't be. It was only a little larger than the one he had used to come here. It dropped down to the surface of the small planetoid only ten meters from the hidden trapdoor that led to the airlock beneath the surface. He could suddenly hear voices in the earphones of his helmet. Lasser? It's me, Fritz. I got your supplies and good news. The airlock trapdoor opened, and a space-suited figure came out. How about the deal? That's the good news, said the second suited figure, as it came from the airlock of the grounded spaceboat. Another five million. The man who was hidden behind the nearby crag of rock listened and watched for a minute or so more, while the two men began unloading cases of foodstuffs from the spaceboat. Then, satisfied that it was perfectly safe, he aimed his gun and shot twice in rapid succession. 
The range was almost point-blank, and there was, of course, no need to take either gravity or air resistance into account. The pellets of the shotgun-like charge that blasted out from the gun were small, needle-shaped, and heavy. They were oriented point-forward by the magnetic field along the barrel of the weapon. Of the hundreds in each charge fired, only a few penetrated the spacesuits of the targets, but those few were enough. The powerful drug in the needle-pointed head of each went into the bloodstream of the target. Each man felt an itching sensation. He had less than two seconds to think about it before unconsciousness overtook him and he slumped nervelessly. The man with the gun ran across the intervening space quickly, his body only a few degrees from the horizontal, and his toes paddling rapidly to propel him over the rough rock. He braked himself to a halt and slapped air patches over the area where his charges had struck the men's suits, sealing the tiny air leaks, and at the same time driving more of the tiny needles into their skins. They would be out for a long time. Neither of them had yet fallen to the ground. That would take several minutes under this low gravity. He left them to drop and headed toward the open airlock. This was what he had been waiting for those nineteen days in cataleptic hypnosis. He couldn't have cut his way in from the outside. He had had to wait until it opened, and that time would come only when the supply ship came. Once in the airlock, he touched the control stud that would close the outer door, pump air into the waiting room, and open the inner door. Here was his greatest point of danger, greater even than the danger of coming to the planetoid, or the danger of waiting nineteen days for the coming of the supply ship. If the ones who remained within suspected anything, anything at all, then his chances of coming out of this alive were practically nil. But there was no reason why they should suspect. They should think that the man coming in was one of their own. The radio contact between the men outside had been limited to a few millimicrowatts of power, necessarily since radio waves of very small wattage can be decoded at tremendous distances in open space. The men inside the planetoid certainly should not have been able to pick up any more than the beginning of the conversation before it had been cut off by solid rock. It was a high-speed airlock. Unlike the soundless discharge of his special gun in the outer airlessness, the blast of air that came into the waiting chamber was like a hurricane in noise and force as the room filled in a few seconds. He held on to the handholds tightly while the brief but violent winds buffeted him. He turned as the inner door opened. His eyes took in the picture in a fraction of a second. In an even smaller fraction, his mind assimilated the picture. The woman was dark-haired, dark-eyed, and muscular. Her mouth was wide and thick-lipped beneath a large nose. The man was leaner and lighter, bony-faced and beady-eyed. The woman said, Fritz, what? And then he shot them both with gun number two. No needle charges this time. Such shots would have blown them both in two, unprotected as they were by spacesuits. The small handgun merely jangled their nerves with a high-powered blast of accurately beamed supersonics. While they were still twitching, he went over and jabbed them with a drug needle. Then he went on into the hideout. He had to knock out one more man whom he found asleep in a room off the short corridor. It took a gas bomb to get the two women who were guarding the kid. He made sure that the Ben Kayim boy was all right. Then he went to the little communications room and called for help. Colonel Walter Mannheim tapped the map that glowed on the wall before him. He's right there, where those tunnels come together. Bart Stanton looked at the map of Manhattan Island and at the gleaming colored traceries that threaded their various ways across it. Just what was the purpose of those tunnels? 
he asked curiously. They were for rail transportation, said the colonel. The island was hit by a sun bomb during the Holocaust and almost completely leveled and slagged down. When the city was rebuilt, there was naturally no need for such things, so they were simply sealed off and forgotten. Right under Government City, Stanton said. Incredible. It used to be one of the largest seaports in the world, Colonel Mannheim said, and it probably still would be if the inertia drive hadn't made air travel cheaper and easier than seagoing. How did he find out about the tunnels? Stanton asked. The colonel pointed at the north end of the island. After the Holocaust, the first returnees to the island were wild animals which crossed from the mainland from the north. The Harlem River isn't very wide at this point. Also, because of the rocky hills at this end of the island, there were places which were spared the direct effects of the bomb, and grasses and trees began growing there. That's why it was decided to leave that section as a game preserve when the government built the capital on the southern part of the island. His finger moved down the map. The upper three miles of the island, down to here, where it begins to widen, are all game preserve. There's a high wall here which separates it from the city, and the ruins of the bridges which connected with the mainland have been removed, so the animals can't get back across any more. Two years after he arrived, the knipe was almost caught. He had managed somehow, we're not sure yet exactly how, to get here from Asia. According to the psychologists who have been studying him, he apparently does not believe that human beings are any more than trained animals. He was looking then, as he is apparently still looking, for the real rulers of Earth. He expected to find them, of course, in Government City, Needless to say, said the colonel with a touch of irony, he failed. But he was seen, asked Stanton. He was seen and pursued, but he got away easily, heading north. The island was searched, and the police were ready to start an inch by inch going over of the island two days later, but the knipe hit and robbed a chemical supply house in northern Pennsylvania, killing two men, so the search was called off. It wasn't until two years later, after exhaustive analysis of the pattern of his rays had given us something to work with, that we decided that he must have found an opening into one of the tunnels up here in the game preserve. He gestured again at the map. It wouldn't take him long to see that no human being had been down there in a long time. It was a perfect place for his base. How does he move in and out? Stanton asked. This way. The colonel traced a finger down one of the red lines on the map, southward, until he came to a spot only a little over two miles from the southernmost tip of the island. The line turned abruptly toward the western edge of the island, where it stopped. This tunnel goes underneath the Hudson River at this point, and emerges on the other side. It's only one of several that do so. They're all flooded now. Uh, the sun bomb caved them in when the primary shock wave hit the surface of the river. In spite of his high rate of metabolism, the knipe can store a tremendous amount of oxygen in his body and can stay underwater for as long as half an hour without breathing apparatus if he conserves his energy. When he's wearing his scuba apparatus, he's practically a self-contained submarine. The pressure doesn't seem to bother him much, He's a tough cookie. Stanton nodded silently and slowly. Could he beat the knipe in hand-to-hand -hand combat? There would be no way of knowing until the final moment of success or failure. At that time, the colonel went on, we hadn't formulated any definite policy on the knipe. We didn't know what he was up to. We weren't even sure he was actually down in those tunnels. We had to find out. He walked over to the nearby table and opened a box some twelve inches long and five by five inches in cross-section. See this? he said as he took something out. It looked like a large dead rat. Our spy, said Colonel Mannheim. The rat 
moved along the rusted steel rail that ran the length of the huge tunnel to a human being the tunnel would have seemed to be in utter darkness but the little eyes of the rat saw its surroundings as fairly luminescent glowing from the infrared radiations given out by the internal warmth of cement and steel the main source came from above where the heat of the sun and of the energy sources in the buildings on the surface seeped through the roof of the tunnel on and on it moved its little pinkish feet pattering almost silently on the oxidized metal surface of the rail its sensitive ears picked up the movements and the squeals of other rats but it paid them no heed several times it met other rats on the rail but most of them sensed the alienness of this rat and scuttled out of its way once it met a rat who did not give way hungry perhaps or merely yielding to the paranoid fury that was a normal component of the rattish mind it squealed its defiance to the rat that was not a rat it advanced baring its teeth the rat that was not a rat became suddenly motionless its sharp rodent's nose pointed directly at the enemy there came a noise a tiny popping hiss like that of a very small drop of water striking hot metal from the left nostril of the knot rat a tiny glass-like needle snapped out at bullet speed it struck the advancing rat in the center of the pink tongue that was visible in the open mouth then the knot rat scuttled backwards faster than any rat could have moved for a second the real rat hesitated and it may be that the realization penetrated into its dim brain that rats did not fight this way then as the tiny needle dissolved in its bloodstream it closed its eyes and collapsed rolling limply off the rail the rat might come too before it was found and devoured by its fellows or it might not the nun rat moved on not caring either way the human intelligence that looked out from the eyes of the knot rat was only concerned with getting to the knipe that's how we found the knipe colonel mannheim said and that's how we keep tabs on him now we have over seven hundred of these remote control robots hidden in strategic spots in those tunnels now but it took time to get everything set up this way now we can follow the knipe wherever he goes so long as he stays in the tunnels if he went out through an open air exit we could have him followed by bird robots but he shrugged wryly i'm afraid the underwater problem still has us stumped we can't get the carrier wave for the remote control impulses to go far underwater how do you get your carrier wave underground to those tunnels stanton asked the colonel grinned widely one of the boys dreamed up a real cute gimmick the rails themselves act as antenna for the broadcaster and the rat's tail is the pickup antenna as long as the rat is crawling right on the rail only a microscopic amount of power is needed for control not enough for the knife to pick up with his instruments each rat carries its own battery for motive power and there are old copper power cables down there that we can send direct current through to recharge the batteries and when we need them the copper cables can be used as antennas it took us quite a while to work the system out stanton rubbed his head thoughtfully damn these gaps in his memory he thought it was sometimes embarrassing to ask questions that any schoolboy should know aren't there ways of detecting objects underwater he asked after a moment yes said the colonel but they all require beamed energy of some kind to be reflected from the object and we don't dare use anything like that he sat down on one corner of the table his bright blue eyes looking up at stanton that's been our problem all along he said seriously keeping the knipe from knowing that he's being watched in the tunnels we've used only equipment that was already there adding only what we absolutely had to 
small things a few strands of wire a tiny relay things that can be hidden in out-of-the-way places after all he has his own alarm system in the maze of tunnels and we've deliberately kept away from his detecting devices he knows about the rats and ignores them they're part of the environment but we don't dare use anything that would tip him off to our knowledge of his whereabouts one slip like that and hundreds of human beings will have died in vain and if he stays there too long stanton said levelly millions more may die the colonel's face was grim as he looked directly into stanton's eyes that's why you have to know your job down to the most minute detail when the time comes to act the whole success of the plan will depend on you and you alone stanton's eyes didn't avoid the colonel's that's not true he thought i'll only be one man on a team and you know it colonel manheim but you'd like to shovel all the responsibility off onto someone else someone stronger you finally met someone that you consider superior in that way and you want to unload i wish i felt as confident as you do but i don't aloud he said sure nothing to it all i have to do is take into account everything that's known about the knife and make allowances for everything that's not known then he smiled not he added that i can think of any other way to go about it end of part four